Hi, I'm Jamie Quinton, Professor of Physics and Nanotechnology, and welcome to this video that I'm recording for my first year class on sound. In our first year class, we talk about sound, we talk about what sound is, we talk about its properties, and we also talk about how sounds are made and how they propagate. Now, and we do that from a physics point of view, and in particular, um, we start to introduce some of the more theoretical aspects of it. Um, and this demonstration, this video, is um, a part of a lecture that I tend to spend um, just doing some fun things with, this, with the class, looking at different musical instruments. Now, we all have the ways of making sounds. We can click our fingers, we talk, um, we can hit things, we can do all sorts of things to make sound. Uh, now, in our class, we've actually talked about how sound is measured, and to do that, I've got my trusty sonometer shown here. Um, this is an app on my iPad called Decibel X, and it has a decibel meter down the bottom here, um, which is measuring the ambient sound level that reaches the microphone of the iPad in decibels. There's an analog meter at the top, uh, and what we call a VU meter, and we have the actual instantaneous level in decibels shown on a digital readout down the bottom here. If I sit in the room quietly for a second, it reads about 30, 35 decibels. When I'm talking, it looks like it's up around 75 to 80 decibels. And if I talk loudly like this, it gets up to about 90 to 95 decibels. Now the thing about the decibel scale is that it's logarithmic in nature, in the way in which it behaves. And every time that level increases by 3 decibels, it's double the intensity of the sound of the one before it. So 80 decibels is a lot louder than 30 decibels because every 3 decibels is a factor of 2. I'll leave you to work out the mathematics of that. Uh, in the top part of the app, we have uh, a spectrum, um, a spectrum analyzer spectrum of the sound that's being received, and it's sampled several times per second, but it's um, probably about four or five times per second. And on this slot, on this plot, we have a logarithmic scale here for the intensity, and a logarithmic scale across the bottom as a function of frequency, so intensity versus frequency, and the frequency range goes from about 20 hertz on the left hand side to about 20 kilohertz on the right hand side. Now it's logarithmic both ways, which means, um, you know, 100, 100 hertz is here, 1000 hertz is here, 10,000 hertz is here, and 20,000 hertz is here. Um, and the reason for that is because the majority of sounds that we hear every day and the ones that we process tend to be between about 50 hertz and about 7 to 8 kilohertz. We can hear up higher and depending on your age and what you've done to your ears um, or what you do to your ears on a regular basis, you might find that the sensitivity of your hearing um, varies from person to person down the bottom end and up the top end. Um, you can also change the display on this thing. So this is a line plot. You can make it a bar graph, which is, um, if you're an audiophile, this is probably the type of thing that you're used to seeing for the sound level. Look at that. I'm seeing my voice on TV. How cool is that? Um, and you can also get a complete power spectrum where this time we've got, you can see it moving as a function of time, and you've got the intensity um, as a function of frequency, but this time the frequency is the vertical axis and the intensity is the colour scheme of the rainbow that's being produced. And I'm making broadband noise. Well, my voice is not the purest of all tones you can possibly have, so you see that it's kind of a little bit 
broad across the spectrum. So here is my voice, I'm just talking, and you can see that most frequencies are roughly equal or there's some small variation depending on whether I talk with my deep voice or whether I talk with a high-pitched voice. Uh, but it generally covers most of the spectrum. Whereas if I try to create something of a pure tone, let's see how I go. So that was about a 1050 hertz, roughly, um, tone that produced a peak in the middle of the spectrum. And then if I do it on the power spectrum, so you can see this is where I've been talking and this is a digital uh, capture of everything I've been saying to this point. But if I create a pure tone, or a roughly pure tone, See how it's changed and you have uh, frequency on this axis, a roughly small band of frequencies in which that's where the sound level was at that instant. Alright, so we're going to go back to the original one and I'm just going to put this here and we're going to keep going. So in our class we've been talking about musical instruments. I encourage the students in, in a lecture uh, to bring, in, bring instruments to class and we want to talk about each of those instruments and how they produce sound. But the most important thing of all is that all sounds begin with a vibration because the sound travels through air, liquid, solid, plasma even. Um, when it travels through the medium, and it must have a medium because if it doesn't have a medium, um, like the vacuum of space, there's nothing to carry the energy of the waves. You need mechanical motion, vibration, and then vibration affecting near, nearby neighbours, um, neighbouring particles in the medium so that the energy can couple and keep travelling. So in space we don't have that, and so sound travels don't, don't go through space, which is why in the 1980s there was the uh, Alien movie series where the tagline was, in space, no one can hear you scream. Great movie series. Um, and in our class we talk about all different kinds of instruments. Um, you know, the orchestra has a, a gamut of instruments um, and they tend to be classified into stringed instruments, um, woodwind instruments, brass instruments and percussion instruments. Um, I can't think of any others, but all of them start with a vibration and they do it in different ways. Um, students bring instruments to class, we talk about how the instruments make the sound, or in some cases how the human makes the sound to make the instruments make the tones or the noises or the sounds. Um, what is a noise? I think a noise is an unwanted sound that you hear. Now in this video um, I share with the class one of my favourite devices for making sound, that's the guitar. So here is a guitar. Um, this is my um, American Fender Stratocaster, made by Fender. Um, and I just want to talk about the physics of this instrument. So here, here it is. Um, it's a six string guitar. It has um, a string, it has six strings. I'm just going to talk about one string for the minute. Um, each of these strings is suspended from this section here which is called the bridge of the instrument and the other end of the instrument up here which is called the nut of the instrument and these are tuning pegs or machine heads um, that are used to change the tension in the string. Now with the guitar or with, the, with any stringed instrument actually um, the speed, or rather the frequency, the frequency of the sounds that are made by the instrument depend on the frequency of the waves that are created in the string. So, in this case, um, well, in the case of the guitar, but in the case of everything, two factors that matter 
when it comes to working out the frequency, um, they're the two things that influence the speed at which waves travel along the string. And what happens is you excite, vibrate, cause motion in the string. You can do it by blowing it, plucking it, bowing it, um, whatever you want to do. But when you pluck the string, it vibrates up and down and it sends waves up and down the string. And what happens is as the, as the waves reflect off the bridge and the nut and they bounce back and forth while the string is vibrating like this, they form something called a standing wave, or they form a multitude of standing waves actually. Um, but the standing waves have a frequency that they oscillate at, and that frequency is the sound, the pitch, or the frequency of the note that you hear. And you can change the, change the pitch because the wavelength of the sound wave is the same and determined by the length of the string, but the, the velocity, the speed at which the, the waves travel depend on the wavelength which is fixed and um, the, the speed which can be adjusted by two things. One's the tension in the string, so I can I can change the tension. I can do it even without moving the machine head. Um, or you can change something called the linear mass density or the mass per unit length per meter of the string. Which is why the most important feature, I guess, of a six string, or the thing that everyone notices when they first pick up a guitar, is that the strings have different thicknesses. They have different masses, or different weights, if you like. And the thinnest string has a different frequency, or pitch, than the, the thickest strings. Um, now, the tension in each of these strings are not necessarily the same, but the difference in the tensions of the strings is smaller than the difference in the mass per unit length. Alright, what else do I want to say about um, the physics of this device? Um, well, I know that a lot of people don't think that physics is very cool, um, but this object, I guess, the most iconic thing of the 20th century in particular, of all things that are cool, actually runs entirely on physics. Everything about it. Um, and the electric guitar uses more than one type of physics, of course, to make it work. So if I had an acoustic guitar, which I do, I've got one right next to me, um, I don't need to do much. In fact, let's do that first. Let's talk about it with the acoustic guitar. Because then we'll reduce some of the complications. Alright, so this is an acoustic. Um, and if you play guitar, um, I'm sure you already know lots about it. Um, why do I play guitar? I play the guitar because when I was in first year physics, one of my lecturers who was actually a physicist who was interested in the physics of music and he did his research in the physics of music, came into class and he played the guitar. And he talked about the physics of the instrument and it just blew me away. And from that moment on, I decided, I, I kind of liked guitar music when I was a kid and I wanted to try and learn, but I never really got round to it or I never really got into it in a serious way. But after that lecture, I had to go and get one. Uh, and I keep learning. No matter how much I know about things, about techniques and how things work, I learn more and more all the time. I've been playing it for 30 years and I still um, learn something most of the time when I pick it up. Okay, so um, we've talked about the strings and the thickness of the strings. We've talked about the tension in the strings. Now let's talk about the properties of the vibrations you get of the strings. So this one has a different type of bridge, but it's a bridge here and a nut here, and those are the two ends of the string that we care about from a physics point of view. 
The next thing we need to notice is that we have these frets, which are these little metal bars that sit under the string. And basically the guitarist, what they do is they hold down the string to change the length of the string from being this long to being whatever adjusted length that we have based on whichever fret they hold down on which particular string. So, you know, this is a G string. This is a G string with a finger down on the fifth fret. The tension's not really that different in the string because I can't push it down so much that I can change the tension much. In fact, if I push it down to the point where I start to have a really sore finger, I change it a little bit, but I don't change it much. And so the strength, the length of the string now changes the pitch because the speed's the same, the tension's the same, the linear mass density is the same. The wavelength is the thing that's changed, uh, which then changes the frequency because the speed is the frequency multiplied by the wavelength. So adjust the wavelength by adjusting the string length, and then you get a different pitch or a different frequency. Now, have you noticed that the frets are further apart at this end of the neck than they are at this end? Now the thing is, and if you notice, you might notice that they systematically get shorter and shorter and shorter as you go. That's not an accident. In fact, um, if you were to look at the actual lengths between each successive pair of frets and wrote down what that length was, you'd soon discover that there's a mathematical sequence that goes with it. And one of the reasons that I love this instrument so much is because maths and physics come together with engineering and mechanics and, and even electromagnetism when I get to the electric guitar again in a minute. Um, that's why this does what it does. And in fact, um, this is the 12th fret because in Western music, the chromatic scale has 12 notes in it and those 12 notes follow a set frequency set of mathematical rules. Um, and it turns out that each one of those notes is the 12th root of 2 times the frequency of the one before. So if I work my way up from Let's go back to that G string. This one is the twelfth root of two times the frequency of this one. Twelfth root of two. Two times the twelfth root of two, which is the sixth root of two. Three times the twelfth root of two. Four times the twelfth root of two. Five. And you go. And when you reach the twelfth one, the twelve, 12 times the twelfth root of two, um, actually it's not twelve times, it's the twelfth root of two to the power of twelve, um, or so I should say the twelfth root of two times the twelfth root of two times the twelfth root of two each time, up to the twelfth root of two to the power of twelve, which is two times, so the frequency of this note is two times the frequency of the open string note. And that is one octave above the one below. And so that's the mathematical ratio that matters when it comes to the chromatic scale in Western music. Um, okay, now controlling the string and the behavior of the waves on the string are all of the things that the tricks that guitarists use to make different noises on this thing are all based on controlling or adjusting. So, for example, uh, you may have heard of something called harmonics. Now, when we pluck the string, we set up standing waves between the ends of the string, in this case the bridge and the nut, and the fundamental mode has an anti-node right here in the middle, and the middle just happens to be the 12th fret. So the length of the string from the bridge to the 12th fret is the same as the length of the string from the 12th fret to the nut. So, if it's wobbling up and down and the maximum is here, that's an anti-node, and there are nodes on the end, um, if I want to make a harmonic where I go one octave up, I need to put a node in the middle of the string so that there's an anti-node a quarter of the way along and another anti-node at the other quarter of the way along. So if I fret the string and I make it half as long, whoop, Um, 
I get the octave above, but I can also put a note in the whole string and leave the whole string vibrating by not pushing it down, but rather just resting my fingertip on it. And then when I pluck the string, I create a harmonic. So I've actually forced a node to be formed here when I do it. Now on the bass string, on the E string, it's actually hard, harder to do it there than it is on the higher ones. Right, so you get these bell tones, which are actually reasonably pure, and I'm hoping... I'm hoping that you see that on the spectrum analyzer. So that's one way to do it. And if you want to get the second octave, you need to go a quarter of the way along the string. Now it's really hard to do it on this end, but up here, a quarter of the way along the string happens to be on the fifth fret, not the sixth one. So here on the fifth fret, this is a quarter of the way along the string. So here is the open string. Let's do the B string. Here is the 12th fret for the second harmonic, for the harmonic. And if I try and do the same sort of harmonic on the 5th fret, I get two octaves up instead of one. Now if I play the note on the 5th fret, it doesn't sound like that harmonic. They're different notes. Uh, because this 3 quarters length of the string gives you a different frequency than if I, because when I play that harmonic, I put a node there and I put a node here. Node forms here automatically. So it's actually this string length that was made by that harmonic. Um, there are other tricks that guitarists use to control the tones and the sounds made by this thing, but they're the basic things that you need to know. All right, going back to the electric guitar, uh, what have we got in addition to those? So. In this case, everything I just said about the acoustic is true, um, but in addition to that, with the acoustic guitar, the string vibrates and then the body of the guitar absorbs that vibration and it has a cavity within it that then um, adds to the tone, um, has an air pocket inside it that vibrates and then escapes out of the sound hole and couples to the air around it to make the noise. And there are different kinds of guitars, so um, there's a resonator guitar over here, which is an acoustic without an amplifier or without any electrification, that has a much better way of taking the vibration of the string and coupling it to the air. So it's actually louder than an acoustic guitar. And old blues guitar players tend to use those. They were very popular for that reason. They were loud before amplification happened. And then with the advent of the pickup, electric electrification happened and electric guitars became very popular because you can take the signal out of the electric um, pickup and do things with it. So here is um, the same thing. We've got a metal string and in addition to the metal string suspended on the ends with all of the things and the physics we just talked about, um, now we have pickups that have big coils of wire. The wire's nice and thin, but there are so many turns on this coil of wire. And then in the middle of the coil, you've got these um, post, posts that sit under each string, and each one of those is a strong magnet, uh, oriented in such a way that there is a north or a south pole pointing outwards towards the string. And when the string vibrates over the top of the magnet, we get electromagnetic induction in the string. The string's made up of a metal, it's got electrons that are free to move around, and whenever you have a conductor in a magnetic field and the magnetic flux is changing, um, we experience something called Faraday's law, where an electric field's created in the metal that's moving across the magnet, and that electric field causes charges within it to move. So the electrons move, and as it's moving across, the electrons move up and down on the string. The string's vibrating back and forth, and so the frequency at which that happens 
matches the frequency of the vibration in the string. And so we create an, basically an electromagnetic wave, if you like. The electrons are oscillating back and forth over the top of the magnetic pole. And then the coil of wire underneath, it's experiencing a wire nearby that has an oscillating current that's going through it. It's not a very strong current, but it's a small one. And then that causes a second induction process to happen. In fact, it's a displacement current effect, if you think about it. It's more Ampere's law than it is Faraday's law. So for our students in first year who are doing Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism, um, it's got both of them in there. And then the coil of wire, which has a really high impedance and a very high gain because it's got more than 10,000 turns of wire in the coil, picks up that signal and then there's an oscillating signal in the coil of wire. The coil of wire goes through whatever electronics, volume, tone controls and so on, and to an output, which is an electrical cable, which then has an electrical signal that has the same frequency as the frequencies that are being made on the string. Now, in this particular case, um, the output is going into this object, and this object's got an extra pickup here, right on the end of the string, um, because this is a MIDI pickup, and the MIDI pickup is used by the guitar effects pedal. Okay, so um, anything you want to do, you can do, and... I think I've got my amp set to about 3 out of 10, so if there are any Spinal Tap fans, I'm not melting any faces or pushing anyone off a cliff at the moment, but it is reasonably loud, um, and you can play whatever you like. basics of the physics of the instrument. Alright, so from here, uh, now with the synthesizer, the synthesizer with the, with the ability of manipulating electric signals, you can do all kinds of things with it. Uh, you've got your clean tone. Oops, if I create some volume by turning it up. Um, you can hear a clean tone here. And you can play anything from, from that to classical music. So, um, for instance, now what it's doing is it's taking that clean sinusoidal sort of signal that's being made by each of the strings and it's modifying them in this object before it sends it into the amplifier. So you can change the, the way it behaves.
lots of fun. Hours and hours of endless fun, making all sorts of noises and hopefully some sounds. Um, for those who play guitar, when you do start to explore distortion, um, the difference between someone who has had some training and someone who hasn't, it actually doesn't come down to how much and how fast you move on this hand. It's all about this one. All of the tones controlled at this end of the string. Right? You can, you can make all kinds of noises, not a problem. Um, but... device and the reason that I, I've got it is because not only does it do all those things to the signal and create all sorts of guitar effects but you can actually do some really funky things with it too. So let me try and give you an example. Um, I always ask the class can someone bring an instrument to class and someone always makes the joke um, yep um, I've got one of these I think of a piano there uh, and this object has something like 500 different instruments within it uh, now if you were looking at the spectrum analyzer here on screen um, each instrument has a characteristic flavor if you like so when you play a note um, it's never just one frequency it's made up of multiple frequencies often made up of harmonics or, if you like, octaves of different contrib contributory notes and they do it with different ratios and the profile across all of the different uh, octaves that an instrument produces produces a flavour or a characteristic which is called the timbre of the instrument. And this device here, the Roland synthesizer, has a whole number of different instruments profiles that it uses to put an envelope around the frequencies it makes. So it actually simulates the instruments, um, which, is, which is quite impressive. The, the modern technology and the way it can do that is quite amazing. So you've got the, the uh, piano I just played there, and it's interesting because if you play guitar you can do all sorts of things like um, slides and, and bends and things. Uh, and rather than do a continual pitch change which or pitch bend which is what you do when you bend a string on the guitar, it's like moving along the discrete notes of the piano from one key to the next and it's really cool. It's a lot of fun. And it behaves differently than the way in which the guitar normally behaves. So it's, it's like getting a whole new instrument to explore, which is what I like about it. That's the fun part. All right. Um, so let's just do a few just to demonstrate what this thing can do, because it's quite impressive. Um, so that was the piano. And a piano is a stringed instrument. Um, so it follows the same rules as the guitar, but the difference between, well, lots of differences, but one of the main differences between the guitar and the piano is that the string length on the guitar is the same for all the strings, but for a piano, the string length changes from being really long for the bass notes to being really short for the high pitch notes. I don't have lots of examples of short strings, but up here at the headstock, we've got... So 
even though the biggest string, the thickest one, has the lowest pitch. Whoa, that was unexpected. Um, at the top end, it's the shortest piece from the nut to the machine head. It has the highest pitch. Um, so I've changed the settings on this thing from the piano. And now we're going from strings Anyway, um, so there's a pipe organ. We can go from pipes to, let's pick, uh, say this one. actually get it to simulate not just a single instrument, but it can do several. Um, and you can make it do things that uh, normally a brass section can't, because you've got six strings to play with instead of one. Alright. Uh, and it also does some non-standard things. So that's actually taken one of the instruments and dropped it down an octave so it can artificially change the tuning even. So even on the guitar, different guitar ones, you can change the tuning. I'll come back to that if I've got time. Um, so that's brass. Um, we can also go to woodwind. So here's an example. <laughs> saxophone and the tenor saxophone is a woodwind instrument and for most people who play instruments they know why but if you don't know why have a think about why it might be a woodwind instrument what's the difference between a woodwind instrument and a brass instrument even though the saxophone tends to be made out of brass all right um, there's a whole pile more here um, while we're looking at pipes and wind um, let me just grab another example. That's a flute. There's piccolos and things like that. Um, clarinet, let's have a look quickly at the clarinet. Of the orchestra are here on this synthesizer. Now, so we've kind of covered most of them. There's still a couple left we haven't quite looked at. 
Um, what about this one? wrapped up in that my autistic spectrum disorder loves this thing and I can just lose myself in it for hours and hours and hours okay so we've covered pretty much examples of instruments from the whole of the orchestra with except exception of one um, and and that's the percussion end um, and there are as many examples of just mention one more so um, so they're all different instruments and there's drums and all sorts of things in here but um, in addition to those we have synthetic ones that have really funky names so each of these patches if you like which is a combination of settings and um, different electronic profiles um, there's also a bank full of ones that are just custom um, labels that have been created by whoever you know by Roland um, and this particular patch is called quantum physics and I don't know why it's called quantum physics but let's have a listen and see what it sounds like <laughs> conventional music won't sound very good with that patch you're gonna to have to change the way you play <laughs> talk too much about the sorts of things that the guitarists can do with this thing but um, 
as I said, there are tricks that you can use, and so I've been using something called a plectrum or a pick. And depending on the instrument you're playing, so the one I've got in my hand is a really thin and flexible pick. And I like that actually when I'm playing the acoustic guitar, and I took it out of the acoustic guitar, or, or, or I've had it sitting in front of me because I was going to play the acoustic guitar. But for playing certain kinds of music, it's really good and it has a good feel, and you can feel the strings and, and so on. Um, and you might be wondering why there are so many guitars here. Um, it's interesting because each one of these you pick up, you tend to feel like playing something because of the way in which it feels when you play it. So for instance, if I pick up this one, I like to play Led Zeppelin and, and that kind of music, whereas if I'm picking up this one, Led Zeppelin doesn't tend to cross my mind. Um, the other thing is, if you want to play fast, it's actually easy to play fast with um, something that's a bit thicker and a bit more rigid. And the reason for that is because a lot of fast playing involves picking really fast, rather than just gliding across the strings. Sounds interesting, doesn't it? Okay. Um. So if I go back to this heavy setting I had before, People use lots of tricks like using open strings every second or third um, note. But this pick is a more rigid pick. I can't really flex it very much. But what I can do is I can run it really quickly across the strings. Um, and I guess the only other thing I was going to ask, and I like, so when I'm doing this demonstration, I like to ask the class, um, who is the greatest guitarist of all time? And invariably I always get the same answer first, um, which stuns me. So have a think of who you think might be the greatest guitarist of all time, and, um, while I'm mucking around, looking for the setting I'm after, uh, which is this one. <clears throat> Who do you think might be the greatest guitarist of all time? Usually when I ask a class full of first year students that question, the first answer I get is Hendrix, usually every single time. And I don't know a lot of Hendrix. Um, he certainly was an amazing innovator, and um, you know, he's very, very much one of the gods of rock and a legend, mainly for the innovative things that he did with the Fender Stratocaster. Um, and of course he was left-handed and he played a right-handed guitar with the strings reversed and played it the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, but he was actually quite well known for using non-conventional chords, if you like. So most Western music's made up of major chords and minor chords, and um, you know we have um, chords that don't sound so nice. So we've got augmented chords and diminished chords. Uh, <laughs> They're the kinds of chords that are used to go, you know, danger's coming. Um, whereas major chords are fuller or rounded, and they have a very, again, a mathematical rule by which they uh, are created, but they sound somewhat harmonious together. So a major chord, a minor chord, and the minor chord sounds a little bit more emotional, and it has that one note that's lower. to play the 
this E flat, E, E9. Who else? Uh, someone might say Clapton. greatest guitarist of all time, um, the lead guitarist from Queen, of course, um, astrophysicist, and was doing his PhD in astrophysics at Imperial College in London in the late 60s, early 70s, when Queen started to take off, and he made the decision that he was going to leave his study and go and be a rock star, um, and did that and did that all the way until the early 1990s when Freddie Mercury died. And then in the mid-1990s, um, he had a bit of a think about it, and he actually went back to his PhD. And luckily for him, um, not very much was done in the field that he was working on, and he went back and completed his PhD, um, which is amazing. Um, and, you know... Um, I, I find that to be quite amazing and quite, quite a wonderful inspirational story uh, and worth a look. So if you get a chance to read his autobiography or um, study him beyond just you know, popular music, um, Brian May is definitely worth learning more about. Um, one of the things in particular, of course, is that he built his own guitar with his dad when he was young, about 17 years old, the Red Special it's called, and... Um, he built it out of an old fireplace and some motorbike and bicycle parts, which is quite impressive because he made his own coils and so forth. Um, but he also invented things to help make things work. And so one of the things that he did was when the coils are actually wired together, there's a selector switch that allows you to pick the first one, the first two, the middle one, the last two, and the last one. On his, he had three pickups and he had switches for each one. And the way in which they're connected is they're connected in series or they're connected in phase where this end and this end are connected together. But because he had switches for each and he could switch them around, he could switch the phases between them in and out. And so some of the... And the cancelling behaviour of the switching for different frequencies means that things like... Um, if you're a Queen fan... Um, Dragon Attack or um, Bohemian Rhapsody, when he plays the solos in those, he uses this out of phase um, combination of the pickups that allows it to have the really high frequencies um, add together and give you a strong signal, but the low end frequencies cancel out, and so it really screams, which is what he was after. Um, I have a Brian May Digitech FX pedal somewhere. Um, which has some of those custom settings that allow you to take any guitar signal, put it into, the, into that pedal, and do some of that stuff with the signal. Um, cool. All right, well, I think what I'll do is I'll end the video in a minute, but what I haven't done is mention who I think the greatest guitarist of all time is, um, and that is David Gilmour. Um, I'm not going to plug the guitar in, but... Um, this is my David Gilmore Black Strat Fender, Fender Custom Shop Stratocaster copy. And um, David Gilmore is the guy called God, God's Guitarist, the guitarist from Pink Floyd. And um, 
you probably can't see it, but there is the Fender Custom Shop plate, and it is a standard Fender Stratocaster, um, with the exception that it has a little switch right here, which allows it to switch on um, this pickup when the selector switch is switched to the first two. So you can actually switch all three on, which a normal Fender Stratocaster is not able to do. And um, yeah, um, it's a very special instrument. I'm very lucky to have it. I'm very grateful to have it. Um, and it sounds amazing. So, yeah. And normally this strap, which is the dark side of the moon strap, lives with that guitar. But um, I like to I like to use it. So. All right. Whoop. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll just finish the video just by playing out um, something, I guess, of Pink Floyd. Mm. situation that we can't really do this um, face to face in the classroom but um, I hope you've had a bit of fun and certainly uh, I hope you've picked up a few things along the way and um, I'll see you next time thanks <laughs>